Yes, welcome back to the Magic Sponge Podcast, a miracle cure for all your rugby league injury issues. I'm Brian. I'm the guy behind all the NRL physio content you see on social media. Got my co-host James. He's here on a Sunday night. It's good to have you here, mate. Look, you've brought in 36 yesterday, a big birthday celebration. We've got Blink 182 tomorrow night, which I'm so keen for. And the footy was back this weekend, mate. Like, it could not get any better for you at the moment, I think. It's a definition of a triple threat, Brian, isn't it? Birthday, into Blink, into Rugby League trials, all the actions back in. And so, yeah, it's been a big weekend for me. It's uh, been a sort of a long one as, as it stands at the moment going into Sunday night. But very much looking forward to tomorrow night, catching up with you and a couple of our mates at the Entertainment Centre in Brisbane, getting around Blink-102. How good? Yeah, mate, it's really, as I think we are talking off air, it's really snuck up. So, yeah, I'm a, you know, we're, we're big, uh, we're dads now, obviously, but I think we'll be heading back to our teenage years and just uh, rocking out some blink tomorrow. Hopefully we won't pull any pull any hamstrings or calves or anything like that down in the mosh pit, but we'll see how we go. Uh, <laughs> but look, guys, uh, I, I wanted to mention the, the podcast now. You're obviously, you know, probably listening on Spotify, Google, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, all that kind of stuff. But we are on YouTube now. Uh, so head on over to YouTube if you search up NRL Physio on YouTube. We are on there. Uh, look, please subscribe, give us a review, thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. It all makes a big difference for us. We're, you know, we're trying to be as professional as we can with the podcast these days. So getting on YouTube, doing video stuff. Uh, yeah, so any of that kind of stuff, if you do enjoy the show, uh, just, you know, you don't have to write anything crazy, just plug in four or five stars for us it'd be great or yeah follow us on youtube all that all that kind of stuff because yeah it, it does make a difference uh and puts us in front of more eyeballs which is great as usual we've got the injury profiles over at uh patreon.com slash nrl physio you can either sign up for a month for five bucks uh and it comes with uh that subscription or the injury profiles themselves are seven bucks and that gives you every player that i think i think it's about 80 players Every player that I think is relevant uh, for injury analysis heading into the season, it gives you their full profile, full injury history, their outlook for the year ahead, all that kind of stuff. So it really covers it. So as always, guys, you know why you're here. We cover all the in-game injuries, the big injury and rehab news, and we loop it all back to Supercoach scoring. Head on over to patreon.com slash physio. As I said, there's all the stuff there. I think the new thing this year is Patreon has a new chat function, which is pretty cool. So uh, like it's a bit uh, effectively like Discord. I've, I've been invited to Discord a million times before. I don't really understand it. I, I tried to set up notifications, and it's just a, a, a minefield. But Patreon's good. It gives me one place where I can kind of follow a chat and it's not too bad. Um, and I do share like any secret squirrel, secret squirrel info that I get, uh, you know, like little words here and there that I can't really post about online because it's not confirmed or, you know, I'm not allowed to post about it or something like that. Uh, yeah, in the chat on Patreon, it goes off. There's not much there, but it's little drips and drabs here and there uh, that might help out. For example, uh, the Ty Munro, you know, um, shoulder news and stuff like that. We got that a couple of days early and, and those kind of things. So it does help here. Here and there. Uh, you got the casualty ward, all that kind of stuff. So head on over to patreon.com slash general physio. But otherwise, we've got some injuries to go through from the trial. So let's run through that now. I don't know exactly what he's done. I would have thought it was an ankle, but I, I'm just guessing. He shouldn't be out for a long period of time. I mean, I'm, I'm no doctor. We have to wait for the scans, obviously, but that'd be more positive than, than negative. Few rugby league trials to whet the appetite for 2024, Brian. So we'll go through these ones reasonably quickly off the top. Brenda Smith, Jojo Fafita, they were knocks out of that game. Don't look like they're going to be missing time. And then following that, Christian Mapapalangi, Zach Wolford, and Declan Casey also sustained concussions. So they'll obviously miss next week at least. Probably people we need to speak to in a bit more depth. First of all, was Dom Young. He was in that hyperflexion neck injury. Pretty ugly looking tackle, that one, Brian. What do you know about Dom Young and injury prognosis for him? Yeah, mate, I think uh, there's been a bit of confusion in the post that I've done around this because I think a lot of people are saying, well, how, uh, you know, how did he come out last night and say he was all good? You know, Trent Robertson has come out and said he was all good last night as well, but then. Um, you know, there's reports today of ligament damage and he's going to be out and blah, blah, blah. And all of those things can be true. I, I Like, I don't think it's controversial or somebody stirring something up or, you know, people are saying he's soft for staying down and they're just making this up and blah, blah, blah. Like, it, 
the a lot of the scans from last night will just be clearing him for a fracture. They want to make sure his neck's not fractured, right? They they don't want to send him off and have a spinal cord injury from an unstable neck or anything like that. But then if he's still displaying some oh, – well, the other thing last night too is, is neurological stuff. So they would have done a full neuro workup, make sure there's no, you know, numbness, weakness, uh, you know, big neurological signs that you'd have to worry about like a, a nerve injury of some sort or a spinal cord injury. So they're just clearing him of that last night. But then today, depending on how he is, they could do further investigations and that's what they've done. They could look at discs um, and, and what they've found is ligament damage uh, by all accounts. Now from those hyperflexion injuries. So when we talk about hyperflexion, flexion, you know, everyone knows flexing, flexing the bicep. So flexing the neck is putting the chin down towards the chest. So hyperflexion is just that movement but obviously overloaded particularly in a tackle um puts the ligaments at the back of the neck under pressure obviously because you're stretching through the back of the neck uh the interspinous ligaments are probably the ones that you know most commonly you'd see injured in that kind of scenario now there was a report from uh the daily telly that surgery might be considered i mean you and i were talking off here we even did some googling I've never seen a surgery for ligament tearing in the neck before myself in my practice. Uh, by all means, you know, when there's disc involvement, you know, these kind of things, you, you start to talk about, uh, yeah, discectomies or or fusions, disc replacements, these kind of things. But certainly for isolated ligament damage, uh, yeah, I, I would be surprised if he needs surgery. Usually it's just you know, immobilization or, or, you know, restricting him from going into flexion to give those ligaments time to heal. Uh, and usually I'd say somewhere in that three to six week range would be about where I'd be thinking. So I think round two, he probably, you know, he's been ruled out for Vegas. I think round two is in about four weeks time. So it gives him the opportunity, you know, if he's on that better end of three to four weeks, he could, he could be available for as soon as round two for those people saying, you know, what surgery or that, all that, um, yeah, like I, I just don't see the report was he could have surgery and still be back in the early rounds. I'm not aware of a, a neck surgery that's that minor that would see someone back that quickly. So I, I'd just be surprised if you require surgery at this point. I think from your perspective, James, I mean, that's me working in the private practice setting, you know, with a more sporting population. But I'll throw to you because working in the hospital, you probably get quite a few, you know, spinal surgeries in there. Have you ever come across a surgery for something like ligament damage in the neck? Uh, so I have, Brian. I haven't seen anything. I guess when you're dealing hyperflexion neck injuries, you're looking at, yeah, like you mentioned, interspinous and lig flavum is the other one that can be damaged that way. I guess if you go in the opposite direction into hyperextension, you're looking at more, I guess, facets, one, and then um, anterior longitudinal ligament as well. If you're going into sort of hyperextension, we would only see surgery for people that have, say, a high-grade ligament injury if they were unstable. So they were upper cervical spine unstable, and you normally get that from looking at plain x-rays when they're in flexion and extension and just seeing if there is any instability there or if there's MRI that sort of leads you that way or there's neurological fallout. So I think in this case, it doesn't sound like any of those things are the case for Dom Young. So you probably would assume a fairly conservative approach there by the Roosters, maybe a short stint of immobilization. But the big thing is if there's any neuro fallout, isn't there? That's probably the big decision maker in this whole process. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. I just... Um... I think he'd know about that by now is probably my big thing. Like surely they know, you know, if he's showing significant signs of weakness, widespread, you know, pins and needles, numbness, uh, you know, those kind of things. I, I, I just, from what I guess in talking to a few different people today, you know, th these kind of ligament tears probably happen in quite a few <laughs> crusher tackle kind of injuries, you know, but it's not always something that they go that in depth like they're not scanning everything. I mean, we come back to uh, the injury. Who is the – his name's uh, – yeah, slipping my mind. The Warriors guy from the preseason whose shoulder – and he got um, dicked over in the in the switch from the Warriors to the Dragons. Why am I forgetting this guy's name? Oh, Ron Volkman, sorry. Yeah. yeah sorry, I didn't know where you were going. Yeah, Volkman, yeah. Like, you know, the, everyone was blowing up. Why didn't they scan his shoulder? You know, all that kind of stuff. Like, these guys, they, they're not always getting scanned for, you know, every little thing. You could yeah, – there's absolutely an argument that you could scan for every little thing. Uh, but, yeah, I think – in summary, this is probably – you probably get ligament tearing in these kind of injuries more commonly than you would 
you would hear about, but they probably just don't look into it that hard. And I'm not saying that to diminish it. I'm saying this is why crusher tackles are banned. People ask, you know, why are they cracked down on? It's because they can cause significant damage to the neck. So, yeah, I'm still expecting Dom Yum back in that kind of three to six week range, and I'd say still a good chance uh, for round two at this stage. Agree with your crusher tackle sentiment there, Brian. But we'll talk about Brendan Piercuri next. Knee injury for Brendan Piercuri. Any more detail than that that you're aware of? Yeah, mate. I saw a, a, an article from the Courier today. Sort of, they had a chat to Kevy and said uh, Kevy indicated he, he's always a bit wishy washy. Kev at times he said, "Oh, look, we're still hopeful." for uh round one you know um which i think i've never heard kevy you know say anything else uh when he when he talks about those things oh we're always hopeful for next week and those kind of things which is just you know kevin a nutshell which is which is good you know he's got that positivity there but the fact that he's in a knee brace i i think that probably the pertinent point that i wanted to talk about here was a knee brace gives me way more concern than a moon boot and i don't know if you're the same but but certainly from a knee perspective. I think the hands-on tests that we can do as physios are, tell us a lot. And so for me to put somebody in a knee brace after I've done a battery of knee testing, more often than not means that I think there's some instability there. Uh, and that often indicates, you know, at least a partial tear of some sort of ligament. Now, I'm not saying this is every time. Sometimes it's just precautionary, but I'm always worried when the knee's in a brace that there, there's definitely potential for at least a, a partial tear of the of the ligaments there and and going back from what uh, uh the courier had posted they kind of said oh it wasn't an obvious mechanism but it was just before half time just before a try was scored he was slow to get back in the line if you look at my socials now i've posted a video where i think that's where the knee injury happened and his knee went directly into the ground and all the uh, you know, listeners and followers of this show will know knee flex knee into the ground pretty much every time you're looking at PCL injury potentially. So if he gets a grade one, a minor sprain, he could potentially head on over to Vegas because, you know, you can see guys come back in one to two weeks from minor PCL sprains. But once you're talking about grade two and grade three, you're starting to look at, you know, two to four weeks, four to eight weeks, this kind of thing. So hopefully it's on that minor end because he was – fantastic today but he's someone and and from a i think a super coach perspective i'll throw to you on this one because let's even assume that he's got like a minor sprain or a moderate sprain he does come back in those early rounds because he was pretty much a lock in my side like i've still got him in my side at the moment i haven't had time to sort of run that over but being a pcl with you know, the, I guess the performance implications of it might, you know, even when he comes back, he's probably going to have to be strapped. His, his mobility might be limited a little bit. How does that, I guess, go to you in terms of putting him in your side? I mean, was he in your side before this knee injury and do you see him being in your side moving forward? So he wasn't to start with, uh, he was probably one of the people I've actually got Kai Pierce Paul pegged in, in that position mm. because I just feel like, before team list come out, I want to have him accounted for because I think that Knight's left edge is pretty lucrative for fantasy purposes. That's a coin flip, though. I can understand if you have Pure Curie there in front of him. This does give me a little bit more, I guess, cause for pause, if, if you want to put it that way. If he does have a low-grade PCL or even if it's a high-grade PCL and he's got to manage that through the year, like that, that would be something I would probably look elsewhere into just because he's got that higher re-injury risk. Um, but that's the way I've set up my team at the present. I just... I wanted to have Kai Pierce Paul in there because there is whispers that he's left edge at the Knights. And if he is, then that's um, a place that has enormous upside. Um, even though Pierre Curry, again, he's on the left edge for the Broncos, getting 80. They're in a good team. They're going to be flying. He's very good in the trials. I, I think that's a coin flip, whichever way you want to go that way. Um, you know, both young guys, ascending talent. So that's where I sit on it. I guess if you had to sort of redo your team with the knowledge you've got at the moment, Brian, is he staying in there for now? I think, uh, like, we'll obviously find out. It's probably harder for drafters. I think, thankfully, we've we've had the weekend where a lot of people would have drafted. Um, if there's any midweek drafts this week, I, I think he's hopefully getting scanned tomorrow, so we'll know soon. But I'll put it this way. If he's missing round one, there's no way he's in my classic team because it probably means that he's got at least a moderate grade or a high grade PCL injury. 
and then I'm like I I would want to see him out there performing because of the performance implications I know that a PCL injury has before I even consider putting him in my side. So even if you're like, oh, you know, he's only missing, even if he it was only to miss round one and they're hoping he's back, you know, round two because they've got that two-week break coming back from Vegas, there's just so many good options at the second row in in that mid-range that I, I just think surely you move to a Kai Pierce Paul or whatever, whichever one of those mid-rangers you don't have, you just switch Piakura to that because you'll get a free look at Piakura from, you know, if he misses round one, he won't change price until round four, everybody oh, after round four, everyone else will change after round three. So yeah, if he if he's going to miss round one, uh, he's, he's a no-go for me. And for draft, I think, yeah, I, I think you still approach him as a, an upside flyer sort of in the later rounds, but I'd probably drop him back a round or two because there is a potential that he misses, you know, four four or five weeks at worst case, which, you know, you don't want to play around with that on draft day if you can avoid it. All fair and valid points there, Brian. Next one, Latrell Mitchell. He's had a knee injury from the All-Stars game. Is this cause for concern for Latrell? No, nah, I don't think so, mate. Like, I, the oh, to be fair, the replay was pretty shitty. Like, it was he was coming across to make a cover tackle right on the goal line, and he was tangled in a whole bunch of bodies. They were doing tests on his knee for the ligaments, so they did ACL and MCL from what I saw, and he did seem to be rubbing on the inner side. So potentially there is a you know a minor MCL injury there. Hopefully nothing too crazy. I know you know like obviously the the Indigenous All Stars or, or the All Stars game means a lot to Latrell, and so there is the the mindset that he could have played through something because of how much it meant to him hopefully that wasn't the case but i didn't see anything on the field because he obviously came back out he wasn't strapped so you'd hope that it's nothing you know nothing too much to worry about so until we hear otherwise i don't think there's much analysis there i think we just have to wait and uh yeah hear what comes back in the next couple of days from south's Jane Braley's the next one on the list, Brian. Hamstring strain here. We spoke about him before in the lead up to the season with all the injuries that he sustained over the time. He's also done a – he also did a stint over in the US with Bill Knowles, I believe, as well. Was that November or December he did that as well for um, – I, I don't know what that was part of. Yeah. I don't know. Was yeah, he, yeah. Was he re, Achilles rehab or something separate to that? But he's also been over there. So, yeah, probably not good news if it's a low-grade hamstring injury for Jaden leading into the season. Do we know what sort of grade that he's sort of sustained there injury wise there, Brian? Yeah, mate. The uh, the report. So he was overseas for just like because it was his second ACL on that knee. I think they wanted to you know dot the I's and cross the T's. So this is a low grade hamstring strain. So look, you know nothing major in the grand scheme of things, but still you know but just a total avoid for me. Uh, you know early on in the season, I think considering his injury history, uh, now you've got a low-grade hamstring injury. We know how hamstrings can relate to guys coming back from ACLs, particularly if he's had a hamstring graft. I'd be surprised if they went a hamstring graft for his second ACL on the same knee, but it might have been his first one was the hamstring graft, those kind of things. So, yeah, he's just someone who I can't see hitting his straps from the get-go. There is an interesting component to this, and I don't, I, I don't know. We spoke about this, what, two, three weeks ago when we last recorded the pod, is that I'd heard then that he was dealing with a hamstring strain because he wasn't, you know, at certain things for the nights and those kind of things in the weeks prior. So we're going back like – late mid mid to late January. But the reports this week, the Knights are saying he suffered a hamstring, a low grade hamstring strain at training this week. So like I don't know what's going I don't know what's going on. Then you've got, you know, the trip over to to the US at the end of last year. And mate, I'll I'll just throw it over to you as the uh as the tinfoil hatter on this on this podcast. We spoke about it last year. We put a reel up about it last year. The Bill Knowles curse, we were like, we hope that Jaden Braley can avoid it. We're not even at the start of the season, mate, and you, it, it's it struck down another player. There's, I don't know what else to say, Brian. It just it seems like yeah, everyone that goes over there, there doesn't seem to be an enormous decrease in re-injury rates that I guess we've observed from our little anecdotal sample. So unless anyone's got more more harder evidence or those sort of things and definitely get in touch or get in the comments and abuse us. Like, sure, we're open to the hearing to those things. But oh, mate, they don't yeah, even need to be in the it. comments, does it? Like, you know, I no, think, no, um, no. you know, what do I, to give the listeners some insight, we posted that reel 
last year and uh, got flooded with about three or four abusive DMs from a certain NRL club who uh, who sent a player over there threatening legal action. We had no idea what we were talking about, all that kind of stuff. Just uh, lovely. This is how much the NRL clubs and the NRL in general really love what yeah. I and we do. Uh, it's just really lovely to hear, you know, the first time we throw a bit of humour into the into the show <laughs> and it goes down yeah, really well. I, I think the funny thing about that, Brian, is we're all – Gene up the tinfoil conspiracy oh. stuff, firmly tongue in cheek, mind you, and to lift the hood for everyone else. Probably the worst people to other physios are other physios. Like we are the worst to our own that you can ever imagine. So if you think there's a collection of, you know, terrible humans in whatever profession you work in, I would raise you a physio on a physio, and that's probably as bad as it gets. We're we're probably the worst of the worst when it comes to professional opinions and disagreements on each other everyone gets on their soapbox and it's um it's pretty insufferable really when you when you put it all together we'll get rid of the physio chat brian we're probably boring people there at the moment we're talking about how much we um collectively hate each other so we'll talk about campbell graham because he's interesting sternum injury obviously had surgery with that he was fairly highly touted for super coach purposes but he's looking like a fairly extended period on the sideline i think it was initially reported the six months which is quite surprising to me that even with a stabilisation surgery, they'd be looking at six months there. Do you think that's an accurate time frame with Campbell? And do you know much more about surgical approach there for, for sternal fracture? I'm, I'm wondering what they've sort of done with him, whether they've done, yeah, yeah what, what they've sort of done pin or plate was or whether they've sort of like sort of t- semi-tension banded it like they would for like, you know, some of the cardiac surgeries that you see. Yeah, mate. Yeah, like this is a... Uh... This is quite an interesting one. I hope we find out at some point because I've had a few, like, you know, you, you could vaguely call them like in an umbrella term, sternum reconstructions, you know, which is there's there's been a couple like post-cardiac surgery, as you say, but then a couple, um, you know, car accidents, these kind of things where, you know, significant sternum injury, sternum fractures. I even had one kid who had the i don't know if you remember jack bird had that like congenital sternum thing where his sternum did not fuse so it didn't fuse over and he had like a a mobile joint in his sternum that like you know every time and your sternum is is so solid because it, it yeah like when it cops a blow you want it to be solid to give you that you know, give you that stability. But this kid, a bit like Jack Bird, had that joint there. And so he got that kind of fused up and those kind of things. But even at, you know, my level, and I was getting him back to, you know, a relatively high level of everyday footy, uh, but it was still around that, you know, three to four month mark. And we saw, I think Jack Bird was around that eight to 10 week mark. Now, I'm not suggesting like Jack Bird's is probably a little bit more straightforward than Campbell Graham's by the sounds of things. Cause you know, Graham had to go through the whole, uh, you know, uh, osteoporosis bone infusion mm-hmm. treatment. So there was obviously quite a bit going on there that, um, you know, we, we just, at the time we kind of suspected that, yep, he's going to get that just as like a little top up and, and that'll have him good. And I think a lot of people have been questioning once again, how does it get to this point uh, and they're only just deciding on surgery now. Why couldn't they get surgery earlier in the off season? Surgery is the last resort for a lot of things, particularly in around something as you know, in in such a delicate area like the sternum. You want to avoid surgery in that area at all costs, and. Obviously, that's why they went to the lengths of getting like a bone infusion and those kind of things, because they don't want to put pins and plates in around an area that's going to cop bash after bash after bash time and time again. We know that putting pins and plates in areas while it stabilizes the area, it does increase the risk for fracture around those pins and plates moving forward. So that's a component that you don't want to do that unless you absolutely have to for his future re-injury risk. You know, that's probably a big thing for people to consider. You've got the risk of infection, you know, all these kind of things, scar tissue formation that come with surgery. Not every surgery is 100% successful and particularly something like a sternum reconstruction or a sternum stabilization, we'll call it. Yeah, it's just not a straightforward 
uh, procedure. So that's why they would have left it because they would have hoped that the infusion would have worked. They've worked at it over the over the off season, and they probably built him up. They probably didn't even do that much contact until recently because he was going well. He was going well, you know, with regular training. He's then moved to contact training. It hasn't gone well. But, yeah, I think probably, uh, I mean, you being in the hospital system, you want to keep people away from surgery if you can for, for a lot of problems, particularly something like this, hey? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wonder with the six-month time frame, Brian, this is me just on my own little – uh, Tim for cloud, but I wonder if he's needing stabilization surgery there. The plates are going to be really superficial, so I wonder if they want to plate him, give him three months, yeah. plate out, give him another three months. I wonder if that's the time frame Good they've call. got in mind there, perhaps, um, to get him back to play because I'd imagine it'd be pretty difficult to play with a superficial pin and plate like that because it it just gets so much contact, um, and it would be extremely unpleasant, I would assume. Um, the only other thing, I guess, from a medical point of view, they do sometimes for people that don't heal up very well, apart from like the um, infusions, as you mentioned, for osteoporosis, I think commonly that's bisphosphonates is what they use, but the fallout from that is like dental fallout, so you can have really um, big issues from a dental point of view. So I don't know if Campbell had side effects of that or what they did there, but the other one that people use sometimes, more so in peripheral injuries like you know distal tibia or distal radius you know those sort of things is low dose pulse ultrasound but you can't really to my knowledge do that in the middle of your sternum when you've got all your visceral um sort of stuff going on there as well so even some of those other more conservative measures probably aren't in play here for campbell so he's probably in a bit of a sticky situation there by the sound of things and i just wonder when i heard six months i was like well it sounds to me like they want to pin and play to him give him a good period of time and then probably get it out before they get him back to the field potentially. Um, what do you reckon about that as a, as a working yeah. hypothesis? Do you reckon that's probably a possibility? Might not I reckon you bang on. Maybe I reckon, yeah. yeah. And in talking about it, like, you know, I, I as I was saying, like it's something where having pins and plates in around your sternum is just not ideal. Uh, you know, moving forward, as you say, it cops a lot of brunt, but also that increased fracture risk around pins and plates and those kind of things. So, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. If it's going to be six months, I would say that is why it's six months. I still think there's a chance that, you know, he could come back around that four month mark, even so. Uh, but yeah, look, uh, like that that's a bit of a light bulb moment for me, even, uh, you know, you saying that because that makes a lot more sense for that six month time yeah. frame, I'm sure. All good. We'll discuss Campbell. Next on to Josh Schuster. He's one we talk about a lot on the Magic Sponge with the various injuries that he sustained <laughs> over the years. Half strain again for Josh Schuster. Um, this is a recurring thing, Brian, isn't it? With some um, delaying his start to the season yet again. Yeah, mate. Uh, I think we could, uh, like, I wanted to mention it here just because it's in the news and all that kind of stuff, but you could just replay what we've said in the past by everyone. I think it's worth noting, I kind of even underestimated it has been four years in a row now. He's literally had a calf strain every oh, wow. season, 21, 22, 23, and now 24. And each of them has the rehab has taken longer than the initial because I went back and searched my own posts and the first post from each year is like, you know, minor calf strain only supposed to miss a week or two. And then the next post after that is his rehab has taken longer than expected, you know, yeah. yeah, so I think there's a pattern here. Uh, you know, hopefully, like uh, I think he's one of the, one of the most talented players going uh, when he's on. So I just hope that this year is his year and he he brings it all back and and kills it. But yeah, there's there's just a lot of concern there. Uh, this repeat pattern of low limb muscle strain along with a longer than expected recovery. So yeah, fingers crossed. Hopefully, he figures it out. We said it on the um, initial super coach introduction a couple of weeks ago with Simon in tow, but I'm wheels up for Ben Trevojevic enormously Ooh, for super boy. coach purposes. So that would be something I'd be strongly considering for those um, listening along to. Next player on the list here, Brian, Ty Munro. So I couldn't find much other detail about this collarbone, shoulder injury, not super specific what he sustained here, but up, upwards of eight weeks he'll be facing on the sidelines. So, so you'd probably lean more towards collarbone rather than like a high grade AC joint even. Yeah, so I was told I was told it was a fractured okay. collarbone. Uh, the mm. a couple of days before South came out and said it was shoulder. So AC, pardon me, AC joint. When you hear an AC joint injury, 
the C is the collarbone. Uh, so effectively it could still be like an AC joint injury and involve the collarbone and have like a small fracture, you know, out in the AC joint partic- uh, potentially. Uh, I would be, yeah, I'd be surprised if there wasn't a fracture involved and it was going to cost him eight weeks. So there's not enough detail for us to be like, oh, he could c- come back sooner because we just don't know enough at this point in time. But yeah, I think eight weeks, I mean, even if they say eight weeks, probably your best case you'd be looking at usually is like a six week kind of mark. But yeah, I think he obviously is an avoid. I think from uh, like, I wanted to pick your brain. Like who do you think, is it a Tane Mill who takes his spot? Cause obviously Campbell Graham's out. So I, I think it, like who would take the center spot and who would take the winger spot? You're probably more keyed in than me on those two. Yeah, I think I'd say Tass is the no-brainer because yep. Whiten's obviously out for a few weeks as well. So I think Tass definitely gets a centre spot now. Probably Tane Mill. I guess Isaac Thompson had a few games there last year, but he hasn't been seen for quite some time. And he's not going to uh, Vegas, so he, actually, he, because of the... Um, put my money on Tane Mill there, but then Tane's one yeah. suspension away from... Yeah, sorry, he won't go to yeah, Vegas, yeah, Isaac Thompson, that. because of his... um Yeah, because of the, the visa issues, I think. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, so, yeah, not too sure who else they got in the wings there. I think Jacob Gagai has been in the media a little bit for maybe getting a run over there. Not too sure how that plays out. The only one I was going to throw in for Tom Munro here, Brian, was Sternoclivic joint, joint. Like, yeah, yeah. Eight weeks would be on the upper end there. We are talking collarbone slash shoulder girdle complex. It's a bit of a stretch to call it shoulder, but it is part of the shoulder girdle if you want to talk anatomical. Um Eight weeks would be probably in like the mid range there if it was a if it was a decent SC joint injury, but we have seen them come back a lot quicker than I have expected in the past. I think there's been a few examples over the years of people back in sort of the three to four weeks mm. without too many big implications. So you, you might get lucky with Ty Munro if you want to roll the dice from a, from a draft point of view. That would be the only other thing maybe to add into the mix. We don't have specific detail here, Brian, do we? So that's a bit of a speculative yeah. guess, but. It might fit that eight week time frame because there's not really many AC joint things. There's not that many collarbone things to my mind that fit an eight week. It'd have to be a fracture, oh, I think, if it was a collarbone yeah. fracture. Yeah, potentially. So. But other than that, yeah, I, it's a bit of a weird yeah. one. Last two, Brian, were the Titans, Dave Fafita with pec tear and Jaden Campbell with the patella dislocation and stabilization surgery. What are we looking at with them returning to the park? I think they've got a round two by from memory if my memory serves there do you think we will see them post by or do you think it'll be a little bit after that man i'm pretty confident on day for feeder i think they're with the round two by i think they're just playing it safe with him um and bringing him back i think in the injury profiles i've, I've kind of said i was going to avoid him anyway if he's coming back from round one just those performance issues around uh forwards particularly coming back really like as soon as they can from pec tears. But we saw with Viliami Kikau, he delayed it to about week 18. And I think round three would be around week 16 post-surgery for Dave Fafita. Uh, and Viliami Kikau coming back at week 18, he performed really well from the get-go. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they're doing. They've got a long-term view, you know, let's get him through the season. Let's not just get him back for round one. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if Fafita's there round three, but I think they've said at the moment round four to five. They've said the same for Jaden Campbell. This Jaden Campbell issue has shook me a little bit. It's probably been the one that shocked me the most coming out of the off season because it'd be a good six months since he's had that surgery. Most players are back in that three to four month range from this kind of surgery post patella dislocation. And they're talking like he's still not back in team training. So Dave Fafita is, has just gone back to team training. Jaden Campbell, not back in team training yet. I had Jaden Campbell locked into my five, eight spot, like all off season pretty much since the well all off season since the game opened i was like yep Jaden campbell he'll be sweet he'll be you know pretty fit from month three to four post and then he'll build his performance over the off season but now we find out he's not even back training with the team six months post surgery i just i think this is a really volatile situation i i could see they've said round four to five i could see it being longer uh i i would be shocked if it's shorter so, yeah, I just think Jaden Campbell, I own him in, in one draft league. I think I drafted him maybe before we found out this news, unfortunately. Yeah, I did as well. <laughs> yes. I found it the same day and I was like, sweet. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, so, yeah, 
like I just think from a draft perspective, I think you just leave him now because I think it's too volatile a situation, maybe as a late round flyer or something like that. And then uh, from a classic perspective, obviously you're just going to wait and see how he goes. But, yeah, I don't know about you, but I was certainly expecting Jaden Campbell to be fit and fire and come the start of the season. Yeah, I was as well. I even thought at worst he'd be round three after the bye. Maybe if they wanted just that little bit more time. I think that situation, as you mentioned, is a bit of an unclear one. It's been longer than expected. There's also not super job security there. New coach, a lot of fullback options. It could, it, it would, I think Simon mentioned it in the, in the preview um, a couple of weeks back. It wouldn't be one that you want to take him wholly and solely at six or one. You probably want to have a few options there that you can maneuver in your team with dual positions. I think if you're going to do it in draft, I wouldn't be sort of banking him being your yeah, out-and-out fullback or your out-and-out six. I think you're going to have a few backup plans there because he may not be that spot for the rest of the year. So that would be my advice on Jaden Campbell. That's a wrap-up from the trial injuries, Brian, and a few things preceding the trials. What we're going to do next, we're going to do patron questions. So patreon.com forward slash NRL physio. Brian mentioned all the details earlier. If you want the questions answered, you want the other things associated with Patreon, that's where you've got to go to get a hold of things there. Only one question this week, Brian. What did you make of Ryan Pappenhausen's return, friend of the show? How long do you think it is until he starts kicking goals? Because he didn't goal kick the other night, but the burst looked pretty good, didn't it? The move, movement was good. Um, I, I was quietly pretty impressed with how he went. Considering yeah, most of the went high, I suppose. Yeah. Look, I won't. Uh, I won't brag too much uh, on many occasions because I don't get uh, many things right. But now this uh, injury profiles couldn't have been more bang on. Or we, I was pretty confident on his return. I've said that you know guys return from ankle fracture dislocations pretty well most of the time, uh, provided there's no open fracture, compound fracture, which there wasn't for Pappenhausen. Uh, it gave him extra time to, you know, work on the knee. I was a little bit concerned still about the knee, but provided that he got over that, like, yeah, I was pretty, yeah, pretty confident on his return. And I also said, look, the, the, my favorite saying is fit to return, fit to kick. Right. So I don't think this is a question of, oh, he can't, physically kick i think it's one of those things where he's had such a battle with injury over the last couple of seasons whether it be physical mental all that kind of stuff let's not put the pressure of kicking on his plate in his first you know however long back especially obviously meanie wasn't there uh in the trial but you know going into round one and those kind of things you've got nick meanie he's a very accomplished kicker let's let paps just focus on returning just let's get him through and once again like the question is how long do you think till he kicks this is a really tough one to answer because it more comes down to when he feels comfortable and that's going to be varied person to person i'm sure he'd take the kicking if they offered it to him or if they said we need you to kick but I, I think it's more a vibe kind of thing, right? It's because it, there's no way he's out there running around doing what he's doing and he's not able to physically kick or he's kicking inaccurately or something like that. It's more just a, yeah, like a vibe thing. Okay, let's get you back out there, get you through. It might be three games. It might be six games. It might be one game. Let's just get you through some games, not having to worry about the kicking, just worry about you know your game and getting through it. That's kind of the vibe that I was expecting, and that's kind of the vibe that I got. I mean, where are you at with it, James? Because we're we're getting a bit away from physio stuff here. I, I mean, if you believe similar that if, you know he's back out there playing, do you think that means that he's fit to kick physically? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, I think he. I'd be shocked if he didn't get the boots kicking for round one. I, I think yeah. probably a trial, probably just another thing they didn't want to put on his plate. I think it was just it was. I think Bellamy's expectations sounded pretty low as well. I think they just wanted a little bit of game time. Um, probably get some cobwebs blown out, a little bit of confidence. I think the kicking was probably just a bit of an after afterthought. I think you'll find him lining up with the boots. There's not really anyone else in the house that's a sharp shooter like he is. I think mean he's pretty solid, but so perhaps kicks at a higher click. So I still think you'll see him there. Um, you're not getting much of a discount on him in drafts at the moment, actually, are you? Because I think there's there's discussion of like, oh, you might be able to get him in like mid two or something mm. like that. But in everyone I've been a part of, he's going late one. You're not getting him yeah. in two. If um, he hasn't gone past ten, in, I've done nah. six drafts and he hasn't gone past ten. Yeah, yeah, always top ten. So yeah, there was a little bit of talk. Oh, you might give me a discount this or that. People are pretty clued on 
that he's got a big ceiling and they're willing to take him in round one with everything going on there, which I think is more than fair. I think that's probably where he yeah. sits, isn't it? Well, is the boys at the weekly rubdown, the draft podcast I did with them a couple of weeks ago, and they made a really good point. It's like if you're at that late round one and you're like pick nine, ten, if you don't pick him there or you don't pick him early round two, he probably makes it to like pick 19, 20 in a, in a 10 team league because all those middle guys have all already got fullbacks, mm. you know? So if you miss him in that early, late round one, early round two, all of a sudden you're letting the Cleary and the Hines owner get Pappy, which just, you just can't let that happen, right? <laughs> like, yeah, even, mm. even though there is a wide range for Pappy, you cannot let somebody have like a Cleary Pappenhausen combo. That would just be. I'd be shocked if that ended up happening, to be fair. Yeah. I think he's he's pretty popular. It, yeah. I think most people are pretty clued on. I'd be shocked if there's a league where someone can go Cleary or Hines, loop back and get him drop at that point. Yeah. I, I don't know. I wouldn't see it. Like, I think it'd be worst case scenario if you were any other player in the draft, if that happened to the Cleary Hines combo, that'd be a nightmare. I mean, anyone, any, anyone listening, out. if you've pulled it off, Send us a screenshot. Tell us. Yeah, yeah. let me know Tell because us. I will give you your championship trophy now yeah. because you've pretty Straight much won game. the whole yeah. game. <laughs> mm, all right, all right, good. guys. Uh, so that's the questions for this week. Uh, obviously, not too much to cover at the moment. Uh, we're going to very quickly just run through little five minute reel. Look, James, you are our super coach expert. So I want you to hit me with just a quick. Uh, team reveal we won't go through too heavy position by position but just run me through maybe a few a lot of teams are looking really similar at the moment so maybe a few point of differences that you have that you're interested in you, you think people you know should take a look at so i'm going api chorus now it looks like he's goal kicking i think you have to have him the round one buy is a bit of a stitch up and you're praying that aiden sees doesn't line up the goals but i think if you can go chorus now brendan hands or whoever gets the nine giga para i think that's probably the ideal setup at nine in the front row, I'm starting Max King as my front row run one. I think um, I could see an argument for Payne Haas or Tino, but I need more money elsewhere. So Max King is headlining there with three other cheapies. Um, I'll throw Sean Kepi in there based on his Rabbitohs performance. I, I thought he looked reasonably good, actually. And if he can just churn out some some base stats there, that's pretty good for me with some cheapies there. The mid ranges. I think everyone will have a pretty similar setup here. Highland Lukey, Sean Lane, Josh Curran with a couple of cheaper guys on the bench. Um, Egan Guy and Kai Pierce Paul is my point of difference. I think he's just worth having in your team for now until you see the team list. Dylan Lucas looms there a little bit to see he might get left edge. But I think Kai Pierce Paul sounds like he's got the inside running from um, from all reports. I know Rugby League is pretty high on him. And I would probably take that pretty closely because him and Jackson Hastings get along pretty well. So I think if he's getting a little bit of inside scoop there that would be the hot source um halfback speaks themselves the big the two big boys clear in hines that's a bit of a no-brainer dylan brown or or munster i could see is probably your starting five eight um and then it leads me to Ponga and turbo at fullback and then in centers um Karaz heads headlines there benny turbo headlines there Taylor may i've got xavier savage ethan strange and chevy stewart depending on what shakes out for the raiders i think that probably won't look like three when it's all said and done it might be two but I think that's um, – I think Xavier Savage, even if he's playing on a wing at 350, I still think there's money to be made there. So I don't see that as a huge negative if he doesn't get fullback straight out of the gate. But we've seen Ricky Shue in the past. He doesn't always go with the young dudes straight up. So I don't know if this is the season where he really has to blood a lot of guys, but I wouldn't be shocked if Savage gets the first crack at fullback before, um, you know, maybe a Chevy Stewart lines up there, perhaps um, who's a little bit younger and a little bit smaller frame. So that'd be interesting to see what happens there. So pretty, pretty vanilla, Brian, for me, to be honest. Anyone else you want to talk to there more specifically or you've got differently to that? Yeah, mate, I think I'm the same as you. Chorus our hands, hooker. The one di- I've got Maxi King. We all know where we're both at with Max King. Uh, actually, of interest, my two guys, Max King, Kiraz, I have only managed to grab Kiraz in one draft out of six. None for Max King. So I've been smoked. The the people know who I like and they've they've come over the top of me and just That's snuck wrong. them from me, which is devastating. But anyway, I uh my one point of difference or, or someone a bit different is Jai Arrow in the front row. I noted in the injury profiles. I think there's 
quite a few content creators. Once again, you talk about uh, Guru. I think uh, I saw Timmy Williams the other day had Jai Arrow in his front row potentially. I, I was kind of fine Arrow from an injury perspective. I think he, in healthy games last year, and, and that's taking away the uh, back spasms, that really kind of stuffed him around and lowered his average. So I think he was averaging like uh, off the top of my head. I don't have the injury profiles in front of me, but around like late 50s. In, in those healthy games playing on the edge for the rabbits. So I'm pretty happy. Look, front row is just yuck. Like I, I, I toss between King and Arrow and two cheapies and King and three cheapies. Like it's just a wasteland because I just can't get up to like a Hass or a Tino with the way my team is structured. And I'd, I'd love to do that if I could, but I just can't see how I make it work. So that's what I've got at the moment. Uh, in the second row, as you were talking, I had Piakura there. I've taken him out and put Lukey in, and it leaves me with $2,000 left in my salary. So yeah. I am more than happy to replace that because, yeah, I'm high on Lukey. It's his second season back from an ACL. We all know where you know, where we love players coming back from ACLs and it's from that second season back. You know, Luciano looks like he's moving on, so that's a big one. Sean Bloor, same thing, second season back, ACL, moving to a new club, Melbourne. Locke, Sean Lane, he's another injury by the year. I'm, I'm really high on him as every man his dog is. Josh Curran and then a couple of cheapies. My halves are like everyone's, Hines, Cleary, Dylan Brown, KO Weeks. Uh, in the centres, I've got Kiraz and Taylor May from an injury perspective, high on both of those guys. Uh, obviously, Kiraz, we've spoken about. Taylor May, I'm, I'm pretty confident on him coming back from that ACL really good in a good Penrith back line. Ben Turbo, that is, look, I, I love the talent, but it's definitely a investment against the uncertainty of the Josh Schuster situation. I tossed up between Arthurs and uh, Bostock from the Finns as my fourth, but I think a winger, uh, as much as I love the Finns and they're going to score a bazillion tries, I think a winger on the Bronx is probably going to have a little bit more opportunity, especially the way Reese Walsh played today. My goodness. So, yeah, he was in and then three cheapies. So, at the moment, just Strange, Eero and Stewart. And then my boys, Cal Ponga and Tommy Turbo. The bottom so we have spoken about them enough uh, i think that's about it james I, look I'm, I'm sure we might we'll try and do a pod next week if there's enough injury content to talk about out of the trials next weekend and we might do a final uh team reveal but uh other than that mate we've got as i said blink tomorrow night uh then both of our wives are off to taylor swift next sunday so if the pod we does would, happen yeah. If the pod does happen next week, it probably won't be Sunday night potentially because we'll both be juggling, yeah, two children each, which will be fun in itself. So we might do a Monday night pod if we do need to do it, if there is enough injury content to go through. Uh, but as always, guys, you know, like the pod, review it, recommend to a friend, chuck us the five stars if you do like it. Uh, subscribe to YouTube because we're loving sort of growing on there as well. Otherwise, mate, have a good week. Footy's back. Happy birthday. Let's hit blank hard and hopefully not injure ourselves. Yeah, I'll keep my Achilles intact um, for tomorrow night at the Blink concert, hey? That's probably the, the big goal. Love it, mate. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. And up the mighty, mighty Redcliffe Dolphins.